let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to the Abacus AI workshop on uh, building uh, your own model from a notebook and using Abacus AI to operationalize it. Uh, to uh, you know, uh, with us today is uh, myself, Bindu Reddy, CEO, co-founder of Abacus, as well as Brandon. Uh, Brandon is actually going to walk you through, uh, you know, the various different steps of bringing your own notebook, operationalizing it using Abacus, as well as like comparing your models potentially with models generated by our um, AI service. Before that, I have a quick intro um, deck, which we will uh, review quickly. Uh, we, uh, once that uh, review is done, we then will get on to the we, we will get on with the hands-on portion of the workshop. If you are near a computer, uh, it's good to basically uh, make sure that you have, uh, of course, Zoom, but also Chrome available uh, or some sort of a web browser so you can actually start use Abacus and you'll be able to walk through with us how to like uh, bring your own data, bring your notebook, operationalize a model, and then compare that model with the models that are generated by Abacus and finally create batch predictions and see the model being monitored in production. So we will do all of that end to end. And after all of that, we are we are also going to send you uh, uh, um, a little certificate saying that you have done this ML Ops workshop and you kind of understand the different aspects and modules of ML um, Ops as well as how to operationalize models and and put them in production. So let's get started. Uh, we uh, today I wanted to talk uh, talk to you about uh, what we are calling AI assisted data science and how Abacus is the first platform in the world which is doing this. Uh, so just to give us context, uh, I mean, this, you know, people don't need uh, uh, that much introduction to why bother, why you should, one should bother with AI. But if, you know, if you're wondering why is there so much hype with AI today, it's basically because AI can be transformational with all aspects of your business, whether it be your customer service, where you can actually use um, things like personalization and recommender models to acquire new customers, as well as predictive models to retain and upsell them, or with your business process, where you can automate the business process, whether it be tech support, or customer support, or uh, even your supply chain, you can use AI to automate all aspects of your business process. And then most, um, the most fun part is actually all the planning and forecasting. Uh, you know, um, the fact that AI can help you forecast into the future and figure out how much, uh, uh, you know, how many uh, items you will sell helps you kind of plan and forecast and optimize your growth. If you think about it, a uh, Fang or right now you probably can call it, you know, Mang companies. You should probably include Microsoft as well. There uh, have experienced astronomical growth over the last few years. Even with the downturn, they're over trillion dollars. All of them, uh, all of these, except maybe Facebook now. But uh, the remaining companies have done extraordinarily well because uh, they've applied an AI-first strategy. Uh, they've really taken to deep learning. Neural networks are now all the rage everywhere. If it, when you look at Amazon, the reason why it is the billion trillion company is that it's able to forecast exactly how much of a particular product you need in a particular place at a particular time. Uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube and Twitter, all of them rely uh, completely on the on the newsfeed algorithm. In fact, there's a lot of drama around the Twitter newsfeed right now. And um, fundamentally speaking, we're talking about a really large AI model, which is generating, um, you know, um, the news, uh, each of your personal news feeds. Of course, Apple is another company which has really embraced AI and has really done well for itself. We all know the Siri Assistant and, um, you know, use it on a regular basis. But lately, over the last few months, I'm sure if you've been following, uh, you know, uh, trends, you see the generative AI has taken off. Uh, so this is the idea of like creating something uh, using a large language model. So you can be either creating like a, a, a piece of text. So you could create like a marketing email. You could, you know, basically allow people to uh, allow your sales team to use AI to like, uh, you know, customize these marketing emails. Uh, also will help uh, with, uh, you know, internal uh, kind of data entry and data summarization. And then, of course, uh, if you are a developer, you probably have used some sort of code gen already using something like VS Code or GitHub Copilot. So um, this is it, it's all the rage of late. And we wanted to talk a little bit about this in the context of Abacus as well. So uh, AI and ML can be a force multiplier. Uh, of course, uh, you know, when we uh, when you talk to a bunch of different organizations and McKinsey did this survey a year or so ago where they talked to about 1200 organizations and they identified AI as the single biggest thing, which is transformational to their organization in terms of moving key metrics like revenue, profit and cash flow again in, in, in the you know in, in the a current recession, uh, basically doubling down on AI makes a lot of sense because you are squeezing more from your business and optimizing your business um, by using this really fantastic tool. 
If you were to use the cloud vendors today, so that is if you were to use an AWS or a GCP or Azure, uh, you know, things are not easy. I mean, I'm sure you guys have tried, uh, you know, SageMaker or Vertex out. Uh, it, it doesn't, it, you can't take a model and put it in production in a couple of hours. Uh, it's close to impossible to do that with those systems. The reason for that is um, most of these uh, cloud platforms rely not just on the core platform, but also on other services to do things like monitoring, to do things like audit log, to do things like, you know, uh, saving stuff in databases. You also are also using that core service. Let's say you're using Amazon SageMaker. There's a lot of heavy lifting to do. You have to create Docker containers. You have to write a lot of code. It takes a lot of time. And basically what, what we've seen is that the chance of success is very low. So you actually create, um, uh, the prototyping is easy. Putting in production is very hard, right? And so you will see that again and again. And that's kind of what we are here to solve. And we are here to make it so that it's very easy to do that and see how like large language models and other kinds of tools can assist you in making that happen. So first and foremost, uh, we like the idea of end-to-end -end MLOps systems. Uh, this idea is coming, um, uh, you know, becoming more and popular, more and more popular right now. Uh, in fact, I would say this is uh, the, the dominant idea that is taking shape in the uh, ML operations and the, you know, taking ML to production world, which is the idea of having one end-to-end -end MLOps platform to help operationalize and scale your AI models. The reason for having one of these uh, systems as opposed to having multiple uh, you know, uh, vendors or multiple uh, uh, modules is that you know, inherently the you know, life cycle of the model is kind of has a feedback loop. And what we mean by that is if you're like building a model, you have some objectives, you have to understand the data, then you have to basically train a, a model, then deploy it and then diagnose and then monitor it, right? So, but once you're monitoring it, there might be issues. You, there has to be a feedback loop for you to like actually look at and see what issues there might be in a running model and then see how you can change the data, how you can change the data prep, how you can you change model training and so on and so forth. So these end-to-end -end ML ops platforms help you, help you with that closed feedback loop, which means putting models in production, debugging these models, keeping them in production uh, you know, is much, much easier. Now imagine if you had a vendor for data prep, another vendor for monitoring, another vendor for training. You know, we're talking about three different systems. These, syst these systems are probably not talking to each other well. Now talk about like debugging something which across these three systems, you know, part of the problem is just them not communicating even. So, uh, you know, our thesis, which actually has been in some sense um, really uh, also, uh, you know, justified or really vindicated by the cloud vendors is that we, you need to have an end-to-end -end MLOps system to build models. And that's what we're going to go through today, Abacus AI is an end-to-end -end MLOps system, which has a lot of different platform capabilities. Now, um, you know, I'm sure some of you have trained models and a lot of people that I've talked to typically train models which are um, useful for batch predictions. But if you're doing a recommender a model or if you're doing an online fraud model, you all really also want to think about real-time capabilities of your model. Right. You want to be able to, for example, if you are building out a recommender system on, say, a retail website like Nike.com, you want to be able to see what the user is clicking on. And then based on the uh, user's uh, browse behavior, you want to be able to give them like real time live feedback. So an ML ops platform should ideally have support for all of these things, including streaming pipelines. So you can data, you can get data which uh, which is streaming from your browser, from your web app, and so on. You want to have data wrangling capabilities. Most of the problem with ML is actually data wrangling. So you want to have like first class data wrangling, data transformation capabilities. You need a feature store so you will be able to like build these ML features, use them across different models. Uh, you want to have both online and batch predictions. Of course, explanations are a great thing um, and so that you can actually convince the business stakeholders that your model is actually effective. And then finally, without model, model monitoring and drift, it becomes really difficult to debug models in production. So we believe having this end-to-end -end capability and having best of breed features in each of these modules is really key to having a, you know, a really good platform. So then the next piece of this is what, what we are calling AI-assisted data science. Now imagine you have an end-to-end -end MLOps platform. There's a lot of pieces to this puzzle. Uh, you know, we have a lot of work to do still in terms of like building out that model and putting it in production. So in the future, what we see is that we're going to have AI assisting data scientists more and more. It's it, that trend is happening everywhere. We have AI assisting writers, we have AI assisting artists, uh, we'll have AI assisting data scientists, right? And so how does that work? So the first part of this is what uh, we're calling a layer cake approach. Here, the idea is for AI 
to build a model for you. And we're going to showcase that in our, uh, uh, you know, in our workshop. Uh, the idea is for the AI to build models based on your use case and your data set. So there are multiple methods you can use to do this. We use something called neural architecture search, which is we use a bunch of uh, different neural architectures. So these are all neural network models and, and try to figure out the best neural art architecture for your data set and for your use case. We also do other tech. We also have other techniques like using classical machine learning. So you might have heard of a, a term that other people sometimes use called auto ML. Uh, and so what we do is we also apply classical machine learning techniques like uh, trees as well as um, uh, you know statistical models to compare and contrast between our neural architecture search techniques. So we, you have uh, you know both of these techniques, both of these families available to you. So you can compare and contrast your model with our uh, with the model that Abacus AI produces. This doesn't mean that you this is some sort of an auto ML tool. Generally speaking, you know, frankly speaking, auto ML doesn't work. Uh, that's why we had to come up with neural architecture search, which is very domain specific. But it also, I mean, there's probably a lot of skeptics about, uh, you know, in the audience who, who are probably saying, hey, you know, I don't even know, you know, what this um, neural architecture search is going to do. I want to be able to have full control of my model, right? I want to be able to know which algorithm to use, what to do, how to cast my model, how to evaluate. Great. Uh, and this is why the layer cake approach. The idea is so that is for you to have complete flexibility and customization. So you're able to do whatever you want really easily, just like you would do in a Jupyter notebook. And the idea is to be able to do that in a Jupyter notebook, but then operationalize it on a platform really quickly. And so, for example, if you need needed data connectors, so like, like imagine all your data is in Redshift or BigQuery or Snowflake, it should take you two minutes, two minutes to connect to that data source. Imagine if you write, have to write batch predictions, imagine you were writing to Salesforce, it should take you two minutes to write to uh, Salesforce. Imagine if you were to write it every day, another two minutes to set up that refresh schedule. And Brandon is going to show you how all of that is done inside of Abacus really quickly and really easily. So let's talk a little bit about the top layer. Top layer, like I said, is pretty straightforward. You choose a straight, uh, use case, we'll show you some of that. You know, set up your, uh, you know, connect your data uh, and then just point uh, the, the data sets uh, with some schema mapping to Abacus and Abacus is able to create multiple different uh, you know, models for you based on that data set and, and that problem type. In addition, you can bring your own algorithm, compare and contrast between our, uh, uh, you know, our algorithms versus yours. So you can actually always benchmark your models. That's a huge advantage we've seen. Uh, we have a number of Kaggle grandmasters who, um, uh, you know, who work at Abacus. Uh, they love to compete with the platform they oftentimes win. Uh, and then every time they win, we try to make the platform better, right? And when they're competing, they, they are basically bringing their algorithm, their sophistication, their like nuance, and then comparing it with what the machine can do. So, so that's the first part of this AI-assisted data science. It's AI-assisted model creation, which is domain-specific neural architecture search that I just talked about. We're the world leader in that area. So if you go to our website and go and click on uh, abacus.com uh, and click on the research tab, you will see that we have over 20 publications in that area in all the top conferences. So we're at NeurIPS this year. We're actually holding uh, a social. So if you happen to be at NeurIPS, please come by and say hello. Uh, we are also, you know, basically publishing four papers at this conference. The other part of this is data wrangling, always a hard problem. Oh, so what we've done is we've made it really, really easy for you to do automated data wrangling. And this means everything from, you know, figuring out how to do missing values. So the AI will suggest a missing value technique and have you override it, for example, to like trying to do complex data transformations across different tables, where we're basically going to use something like code gen to be able to like easily create code or create SQL to be able to like give you the data transformation that you want. I talked a little bit about our research already. Here are some examples of some of the research papers that we've written, as you will see, a lot of them in Europe, some of them in ICML and, and some of them in ICLR, all top AIML conferences. So, you know, we talked about auto ML uh, a little bit. We talked about neural arch architecture search. And like usually, like I said, the skepticism is, hey, it's by itself isn't very useful. It helps only with model creation. A lot of other modules still not need uh, more automation. Real world data is far more complex, right? So, in, to, so then we kind of get into the bottom layer where basically we're saying, hey, we're going to be able to create our own model, bring your own algorithm. 
So uh, Brandon is going to walk you through that. We're, we have kind of state-of-the-art notebooks as part of Abacus AI. So you will see that if you were to use our uh, a free account that we're going to give you, you get to use these notebooks. Uh, you get to play with them. Uh, we also have some uh, uh, GPU notebooks uh, and you can try that out. I mean, it's not infinitely free, but uh, you can actually uh, take a look. And then you can also email us if you would like to like get a demo or want to try a POC for your organization or you know want to like dig deeper into that this platform. So uh, these are all the pieces when it comes to like building a model. You need data cleaning, you need EDA, you need models, you need you know validation and so on and so forth. Uh, and if you look at even tabular data, not just like say language data or vision data, you still have a bunch of different steps that you have to go through. We're gonna walk you through some of these steps today. Uh, when it comes to something like personalization, it's, it's even, even more difficult, even more complex, because now we're talking about you know, a, a, a real-time API and real-world data. So you're basically getting in uh, you know, data uh, on an ongoing basis. You wanna be able to have a real time feature store, you want to be able to like produce recommendations live. Again, Abacus is very much capable of doing this. In fact, when you do get access to your account, you will see personalization and a whole host of personalization use cases that you can now, you know, try out. Uh, we also have uh, uh, a lot of language use cases. For language, we have something very unique, which is that we actually bring in a lot of these uh, really large language models, and we will basically be able to train all of, fine tune all of these models across a variety of different uh, uh, you know, parameters. So basically we're talking about fine tuning, like a, Rob a Roberta model, an XLNet model, a BERT model, and so on. And we, we, will, we will fine tune all these models for your data set. So what that means is in some sense, we're like going through and doing a full sweep on all the SODA language models to see what is the best language model which can be tuned for your data and for your use case. It's something again super unique to Abacus, not present in any other platform in the world. So uh, as we know, lots of companies sometimes are dedicated to each of these modules. We have like feature store companies, we have model monitoring and drift companies, we have vector matching companies. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of manual data science work involved. You have to do data wrangling and featureization, model creation, experimentation, prototyping, productionization. And so what we want to do and show you is how to do all of this really quickly and easily. Part of this is dashboarding, right? You want to automatically be able to like create dashboards for your data sets because then you don't have to do like data analysis and data visualization, write code for that, look at that in more detail because the first thing you want to do when you have your data is to understand it. So Abacus provides these really cool exploratory dashboards which let you like look at things like outliers, let you look at things with distinct values, look at the shape and the size of the data so you know what type of data you're dealing with. And this all happens automatically and it's, it's pipelined as well. So if you have like, let's say um, you have to build, a, uh, you have to train a model every one week, let's just say, and there's new data as you train models, this dashboard gets created automatically. The other piece of this dashboarding is at the end of the cycle, right? Once you have your model uh, trained and deployed and in production, what happens? You're basically getting uh, predictions and, and you know, for one month, two months, the model works really well. After two months, something's gone wrong. How do you debug that? So to to in order to like you know figure that out, we have a lot of really really powerful drift features and, and drift dashboards, which help you understand how your prediction data is deviating or changing compared to your training data. So you can look at various different drift metrics. You can again look at data integrity issues. You can look at outliers. Lots of depth here to be able to debug, understand what your model is doing in production. Next piece is explanations. You, without explanations, business stakeholders sometimes aren't happy. They want to be able to see um, you know, exactly why a prediction is what it is. Again, Abacus has four different types of explanations built into um, the system. We have uh, uh, SHAP, uh, which we've modified specifically and uh, you know, kind of taken open source package and really kind of like you know, gone the next level to like make sure that it's somewhat useful. Explanations in ML are generally not you know, the best, but this is the best we can do at the moment, given the state of the art. Uh, and then we have other three other types, LOFO, uh, which is a very easy method where you just leave one feature out, very intuitive method, which we, which Abacus supports. Uh, permutation importance, another method we support. And then we also show you null feature importance. So we have four different methods in the system just for explanations. Other part of the uh, product, we have uh, a lot of monitoring dashboards support for streaming, how to monitor stuff, real-time latency. 
And then let's come to the last piece of this presentation, which is around large language models. So now we have this end-to-end -end MLOps platform. You can bring your own models. You can use Abacus to create models. You can monitor drift. You can do exploratory data analysis. You can do transformations. So all very cool. So this is all end-to-end. -end. You have a lot of dashboarding, you have a lot of tools, but there is still something missing because you still have to write a lot of code. And this is where LLMs come in. So if for all of you who don't know, LLMs have like really gone crazy in terms of uh, being very buzzy over the last few years. Uh, we started uh, about three or four years. I think GP2, GPT-2 was 2018, if I'm right, with just 1.5 billion parameters. Now, of course, we're at 640 billion. This uh, slide is already out of date. GPT-3 is 175 billion. Palm from Google is at 640 billion parameters. So these are really large models trained on large corpuses of data, including code, including you know Wikipedia, and so on and so forth. And the model to understand kind of the English language or for that matter, any language, but also kind of understand things like um, uh, uh, Python code and SQL code and so on and so forth. So they're really, really famous and well known for text generation. In fact, there was a story recently where a Google engineer had to be put on leave because he thought the large language model was actually sentient. So, you know, they've become really good. So if you want to play around with a large language model, we, we are working on a few of them, but you can also use OpenAI, try to play around with that. There's a lot of large language models you, uh, which are now available for at op in open source as well. The thing that we are most excited about is code generation. We, you know, if we have time, we'll show you. Uh, there is uh, a couple of features and as part of Abacus that we've also released to do code generation, which is instead of having to like write the code that I just talked to you about, like if you were to bring your own algorithm, you would just type in a prompt, and and the you know an R code gen model will actually generate uh, a piece of code for you, so that it's very easy to like rapidly iterate and you know walk through the things. And so in, in, in a sense, we want Abacus AI to be programmable, make it very easy to specify custom data transformations, have the code be generated and so on. Again, we'll show you a little bit of that if we have time. And so to summarize, AI-assisted data science is one, having an end-to-end -end MLOps platform for pipelines and plumbing. So that's what we're gonna go through. We're gonna show you how that, uh, what that is. We're going to like help you bring your own notebook and, and, take, uh, and actually operationalize it. To, to a domain specific neural architecture search for model creation. So we're gonna be able to like show you what models uh, are created by our AI and how you can compare your models to our models. Three, dashboarding for data visualization and data monitoring. There's a lot of dashboards, as I mentioned, which you need to like actually take a look at if you wanna understand your data. And then four, code gen to program the MLOps platform, right? Uh, so the workshop today, I'm just going to hand it over to Brandon, is uh, all around bringing your notebooks, using Abacus AI hosted notebooks, using our MLOps platform, comparing against our state-of-the-art algorithms and monitoring these models in production. Uh, we will try to go very slowly. Uh, you can follow along. And, uh, you know, as part of this, we'll also, we're also giving you free accounts to Abacus AI. So yeah, Brandon, you want to take it away? Sure thing. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to our workshop. Uh, so in order to access, I'm going to go ahead and post uh, a link in our uh, chat here. Uh, I've also gone ahead and posted this in the QA. The Q&A is a little bit more recorded than the chat. It's less uh, ephemeral. Uh, so there's actually a question from uh, Muhammad Usam, uh, and he's asking, how can we get free access? So you can utilize the access token that I posted there. And then additionally, there's a Google Drive link, which you can utilize to uh, download our notebook that we're going to be walking through. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. I'll share my screen. And what we're going to be looking at, first and foremost, uh, here is the Google Drive. Uh, you should be seeing a E2E MLOps workshop uh, IPI notebook. Go ahead and download that guy. Once you have that downloaded, uh, go ahead and go through our signup process. So what this is going to take you through is you're going to go to a screen that's going to ask you for your email as well as a password. Our password does require a special character as well as eight characters and a number. Go ahead and input all of that information and you should be taken to a screen that says create organization. Uh, from the organize it, create organization screen, go ahead and create an org. Uh, you can name it whatever you would like. Uh, for example, I named mine Brandon Workshop Demonstration. Uh, once you create the org, you should be uh, seeing a screen that looks like this. It says, welcome to Abacus AI, uh, create a project. For now, we're actually not going to create a project. I'll give everybody a couple minutes to catch up there. 
Once you're on the screen, the first place we're going to go to is notebooks. So you can see here uh, that we do have uh, the ability to host Jupyter notebooks directly in our platform. Uh, what we can do is we can create a notebook. Uh, what this will do is it'll take you to a creation screen that'll allow you to create a notebook with different memory sizes. For the intents of this uh, workshop, we're going to keep it at 16 gigabytes. Uh, again, you can name your notebook whatever you'd like. Uh, I named mine Brandon Workshop Notebook. I'll go ahead and create a second one so we can see. Uh, additionally, we do allow for GPUs to be enabled in our notebooks. Again, we don't need that for this workshop. Those are obviously more cost intensive. Uh, so let's go ahead and stick to that 16 gigabytes and GPU enabled no options. I'll go ahead and hit create. Uh, and you should be seeing a screen here that is, uh, it's gonna say initializing and then deploying and then finally connecting. Uh, basically what we're doing here is we're spawning a Jupyter Notebook instance. Uh, which will allow you to uh, upload that notebook that we just downloaded uh, into a, a Jupyter Notebook environment. You can see I'm already connecting here and getting into my instance. Once you're in your instance, you should be seeing this screen here. Uh, I'll go ahead and pause and make sure everybody's there. See if there's any questions. Okay, so I'll go ahead and drag and drop that notebook, which I downloaded earlier, uh, into our uh, Jupyter environment. My E2E ML Ops workshop notebook. So I just dragged and dropped. You probably could not see my file system, but uh, it's, it's again, it's a simple drag and drop operation. And I'll go ahead and open up that notebook. Uh, so you'll see here that we do have a bunch of cells pre-populated. And what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be walking from uh, generating our own local model, uh, pulling that model into Abacus AI in two different methods. Uh, as Bindu mentioned, the first method is just having your isolated model running independently. And then the second method is actually bringing your model to run alongside our uh, current uh, machine learning uh, and AI algorithms that we've implemented. Uh, obviously, we've been spending a lot of time on implementing and improving those algorithms and have used a large knowledge base from all of our uh, employees and Kaggle grandmasters in order to improve those algorithms. It's really fun to be able to take your algorithm, import it with our own, and then see how you compare and contrast. So to get started with the notebook, we'll go ahead and install our uh, Abacus AI client. Uh, what this is demonstrating is that in the notebook environment, you can actually pip install whatever you would like. Uh, so for here, I'm going to pip install and upgrade my Abacus AI client to ensure we have the latest version. If there's other packages that you would like to utilize as well, again, it's just that simple pip install command. Uh, that being said, of course, we, we support requirements.txt. So if you have an entire requirements package file that you'd like to install, uh, you can definitely do that as well. Uh, so once my packages are installed into my kernel environment, I'll go ahead and import those packages. Uh, we're primarily just going to use uh, Pandas and the Abacus AI API client and API exceptions. Once we have all of our packages installed, I'm going to head, I'm going to go ahead and begin to build that local model. So obviously the first step in building a local model, we need to import our data set. So I'm going to do that with the classic pandas.readcsv. And you can see here I have my concrete data frame uh, data set built into or uh, loaded into our notebook environment. Basically what this data set is, is it's a bunch of different attributes uh, of concrete mixtures. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be predicting the CSMPA of these different concrete attributes, of these different concrete mixtures. 
Uh, CSMPA, I believe, is the constructural strength of that concrete. It's a, it's a standardized unit. I'm not a, I'm not a concrete expert, so I don't know exactly what that means, but we're going to be trying to predict it. So I'm looking at the chat and it seems like some of you have ran into the uh, assertion errors that I put in here. Uh, I did this on purpose. Uh, what you'll see here is when we try to execute this transform code, uh, we'll hit an assertion error. Uh, we need to provide a constant to use in featureization. So what this transform concrete function is going to be doing is we'll be uh, just manipulating and modifying this data set using a simple Python function. Uh, all I'm really doing here is just uh, manipulating the different attributes of the concrete based on whether or not it has a flash value or not a flash value. Uh, this featureization doesn't mean too much, but I just wanted to exemplify that we can provide uh, featureizations here and modify our code before, uh, modify our data set before training against it. So within the transform function, you can uh, provide any constant. Uh, I'll just do 15. You can do 100, 1,000, whatever. It doesn't really matter. So I'll go ahead and re-execute that function definition. Uh, and you'll notice that we did import pandas again here within the function definition. I'll, I'll explain why we do that a little further down the line. So now I can go ahead and execute my transform function. And I can see I'm getting a modified um, data frame back. Now, this data frame is slightly different from what we had before due to my featureization transformation. Once we have our data set featureized, uh, we're going to go ahead and assign a train and test split. Uh, so basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use sklearn. Uh, in order to define a 90 to 1 uh, train test split. And I'm going to define that by adding a new column train test. So basically what we'll have is we'll have a single um, a single data frame, which has a new column train test, splitting 90% of the data into train and 10% of that into test. Next, I'll do a little uh, a lock where all of our train columns will get the concrete training data and all of our test columns will use that for our prediction data. Additionally, I'll drop the train test column afterwards. Next, we'll go ahead and define our local training uh, function. All we're doing here is a simple linear regression and we're also utilizing some quantile transformers uh, for our numeric columns. Uh, we're going to do 20 different quantiles and transform those numeric columns. Uh, once those tr are transformed, we'll pass that into our linear regression fit and generate a really simple linear regression model. You'll see that our train function has four different return parameters. Uh, we're returning all of the columns that we trained with, the target column that we utilized, our transformer, as well as our uh, final linear regression model. We'll go ahead and execute that. We'll let that train on this next slide, on this next cell here. We'll train the model and then we'll see all of our outputs. You can see that our linear model is getting a R squared of 0.91. Again, this is just a toy model. We're not really looking at performance. We're looking at how to utilize the system. Uh, additionally, we see the columns that were returned, our target column, our transformer, as well as the uh, linear regression uh, function. So once we have a local model trained, how do we leverage it? How do we utilize that local model? We generate predictions. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to actually generate a predict many function, where instead of ingesting a single query, we're going to ingest a list of queries, iterate over that list of queries, and then return a list of results. We'll go ahead and execute that so our kernel has the definition. And finally, utilizing our prediction data orientated as a dictionary, a list of dictionaries, uh, I'll go ahead and predict over that list of dictionaries to generate some results. You can see here the first five items that we're, uh, that we're getting, the first five results that we're getting is 37.7 about, 47.6, et cetera. So what we now have is we have a fully functioning model where we can ingest data, train against it, and then do predictions. This is all running locally. There are no pipelines. There are no uh, infrastructure associated with it. And there's no way to easily refresh and uh, utilize this model. 
So the next steps that we're going to do is we're going to bring this model into the Abacus AI system. In order to do that, let me go ahead and execute this. Uh, the first thing we need to do is we're going to instantiate our client. So we're going to instantiate our client by calling client equals API client. And then we're providing a specific server, workshop.abacus.ai. Uh, in other environments, you're going to utilize this domain here, workshop.abacus.ai. If you're in our production environment, that may just be abacus.ai. Whichever environment you're utilizing, you need to um, um, uh, utilize the corresponding server. Okay, now that we have our client instantiated, uh, we can go ahead and create our first project. The first project we're going to be creating, uh, the use case will be Python model. This corresponds to our custom Python model projects. Uh, in these projects, what we'll be doing is we'll be injecting our user code that we use to define our model as well as our predictions into the Abacus product. Uh, this will allow you to leverage our infrastructure as well as our uh, automated pipelines uh, in order to have your model uh, monitored and maintained within the Abacus platform. I'll go ahead and execute this and create our first project. Now that we have a project, let's bring our data into it. You'll see here that I'm, I have another assert for you. Uh, we have to have unique prefixes on all of our uh, feature groups in order to ensure uh, unique names. Uh, when we have a bunch of feature groups, which are our main mode of uh, table transformations, uh, we need to ensure that we have unique names so input and output feature groups do not get jumbled up. Uh, this unique prefix, uh, is, it's really good to have here because then you can always uh, modify this unique prefix and then rerun the entire notebook completely fresh. I'm going to go ahead and name my prefix Brandon unique prefix, and I'm going to provide an underscore at the end there. Okay, let's bring our first data set into uh, Abacus AI. The way we're going to do that is you'll actually see we have this really helpful API function called create feature group from Pandas data frame. So all we're going to do is we're going to pass that concrete data frame that we init uh, initially uh, created up here with our read CSV. We're just going to pass that to our create feature group from data frame function and then we'll generate that data frame in the product. A couple of things to note about these API calls, you'll see I'm utilizing a try accept block here. Uh, the reason I'm doing that is for when I rerun this cell, instead of recreating the feature group again, I'm going to actually uh, just describe it, utilizing its table name in order to populate my concrete feature group variable. Uh, as I said before, we do not allow name conflicts to exist across our feature groups. So this API exception is catching that name conflict. Additionally, we only allow you to add that feature group to a specific project once. So I have another try accept statement here to add that feature group to the project. If it already exists in that project, then we'll print our exception saying, hey, we already have that feature group. In order to organize and be able to better look at our different feature groups, uh, what we do is we can add tags. When we have tags, it allows us to sort and filter through our feature groups a lot easier. Finally, our API has a lot of these helpful wait calls, which will allow you to wait for an object or artifact to be prepared and ready. I'll go ahead and pause for a little bit and browse the Q&A as well as chat, see if there's anything that uh, really needs address. Uh, so for any of you who are still uh, not having the Google Drive and sign up links, we do have, uh, thank you, Gloria, for posting it in the Q&A. Uh, you can access it there. Uh, I'll go ahead and answer that. Thank you. Uh, for anybody who received the API exception invalid API key error, the fix for that is to ensure that in your uh, API client initiation uh, instantiation, you do have this HTTPS uh, HTTPS 
workshopadvocates.ai, and you should make sure that corresponds to the same address that you have in your browser, workshop.advocates.ai. Uh, somebody asked if we are running all of this code on a Jupyter server. That's correct. Um, and then as we call our Abacus API, that will leverage the uh, Abacus specialized servers, basically uh, utilizing our own infrastructure. Uh, that's a very scalable infrastructure. We have a really, really strong infra team. Uh, this can scale up to data sets of trillions of rows long, um, as well as our models are able to ingest those trillion row long data sets. Um, so yes, right now we are running this on a simple Jupyter server, which we instantiated with 16 gigabytes of memory. Uh, but of course, as we call the API, that's going to be running on Abacus directly and utilizing all of our infrastructure there. Uh, for anybody else running into general errors here, make sure that you've executed all of the cells before going uh, too deep. Um, again, I'm seeing that we are moving a little quickly. I'll try and slow down as much as I can. Uh, I do want to cover all of the material we do have here, though. Jumping back to our notebook, I'll go ahead and uh, hop back here. Uh, you can see that we waited for our feature group to uh, create, and we can actually see this reflected in the UI. Uh, I think I, I think this would be a good time to go ahead and open a new tab in your Chrome browser. And you can hop to our project list. So in your project list, you should see that you've created a new uh, a new project with the custom Python model use case. And if we click into that project, we can see that we have our concrete attributes data set loaded into the project itself. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time here, just a reflection of how we've created a project and then have brought a data set into that first project. Moving forward, uh, as we did earlier, we did featureize and manipulate our data. So we do have that uh, capability fully possible in Abacus. What we allow you to do is execute your own Python code against different input tables in order to apply your own featureizations. We can pull in our uh, Python functions directly uh, from this uh, from this notebook. First, what I'll do is I'll create a Python function. This is a generalizable function that you can pass any sort of input data to and then receive a similar output. I'll go ahead and execute that. Once we've created our function, I'll actually go ahead and update the function code. Uh, so you can see here, I'm just calling our Python transform function name and then passing that callable that we defined earlier, transform concrete, in order to apply it to our Python function. Additionally, the most important part here is that we have function variable mappings. These are the inputs to our function. So you can see that we have a input variable concrete data frame, and that variable type is a feature group. So now what we have to do is we have to bind a feature group that we want to pass to our function uh, to, to those uh, function variables. So what I'll do here is I have a little list and dictionary comprehension where I'm taking all of the input feature groups I want and then binding them to all of the variable mappings that we have. So I want to use that original concrete feature group that we made up here using our data frame. I'm going to pass that feature group itself uh, to this function. Uh, you can see I have my transform bindings defined here, where I have my unique prefix concrete attributes, uh, and it's going to be passed as the concrete data frame into this function. Now that we have all of our mapping set up, all of our bindings created, what we can do is we can actually generate a completely new feature group, passing in our concrete feature group to our transform function in order to define a new Python feature group. I'll go ahead and execute that. Additionally, you can see our classic try except block here, where we are trying to create the feature group. If it already exists, we'll simply describe it. 
And then finally, we try to add it to the project. I'll go ahead and execute this cell twice so we can see that exemplified. So on the second execution, you'll see that it, we get this already exist error. Feature group branded unique prefix concrete transform feature group already exists. And then additionally, our feature group with ID 98 ADA already exists in our project 4D, uh, F40, et cetera. These are all IDs. This is a feature group ID, and this is a project ID. We can easily see that that's the case by going to transform feature group dot ID. And then additionally, we can say uh, custom Python project dot ID. So two things I'm exemplifying here. First of all, these notebooks obviously have code completion. That's a really helpful tool for getting through these new APIs. If there's an API you're unfamiliar with and want to learn more about, it's very easy to uh, just utilize the notebook's auto completion. Of course, we have full end to end documentation across all of these APIs as well. Uh, we can provide that information to you at the end of the presentation. Anyways, just validating we're looking at the right things here. Transform feature group ID matches with what we saw here in this error. And then our custom Python project ID aligns as well. So let's continue forward. The next thing that we did, if you recall, we first transformed and featureized our data, and then we applied a data split to it. So we split between uh, test data as well as train data. I'm going to apply that same split function here and creating a new Python feature group. Uh, so we're going to go through the same process where I create a Python function. I update that with my assign train test split function code. I create my bindings. And then finally, I create a new Python feature group. We'll step through this. The important thing to note here is that we are able to pass. Uh, uh, and then let's go ahead and actually execute this cell as well, where we materialize and generate that feature group. This materialization will take a little bit of time. So I'll go ahead and pause and discuss what we've been doing so far. Uh, again, as I mentioned, what we've done is we've created a Python function. We've given it a, a certain callable as code. We've applied mappings to what we want to pass into that function. And then finally, we generated a new feature group utilizing that function. Uh, we can see this all reflected again in our UI on our other tab here. If I refresh the page, you'll see I have three feature groups in total. First, our transform, our data split, and our parent feature group, which is our uh, concrete attributes. It's really cool here that we can pass a Python function uh, output into another feature group. That's one of the more unique things that we have is the ability to chain these feature groups together, utilizing any type of feature group that you would like. So when I create a Python feature group, I can pass that into another Python feature group. And then finally, I can pass all of that into an SQL feature group, which we'll show in a couple seconds here. Go ahead and pause again, see if there's any other QA questions. A uh, great question here. Can you please summarize what a feature group is? Uh, a feature group, uh, let's see, what happens if I hit answer live? Uh, so basically what a feature group is, is it's a table. It's a table which we can apply different uh, manipulations and transformations to. Uh, we can really visualize this in our uh, AI, in our UI, where if I go here, if I go here, you can see uh, we have our uh, ability to explore and view the features of a feature group. Uh, for Python feature groups, this does require materialization. Let me go ahead and pull up this uh, still materializing. Let me pull up this concrete attribute one. You'll see we do have a materialized version. Basically, what material uh, materialized what materializing a feature group is doing is it's changing from simply a table view to an actual table. Uh, so if we hit the Explore tab, we can see that we have all of our different features here. And then we have some information about each feature, the number of distinct values, uh, the amount of completeness, uh, as well as some basic statistics, mean, max, standard deviation, et cetera. We can also zoom into these value distribution graphs and see how our values are distributed uh, across that uh, column. Additionally, we can do a materialized data view which will allow you to see your raw data, uh, raw data table uh, in full. 
Uh, we're still waiting on that materialization. So once, uh, once we have this raw data table, one of the big powers that we have is being able to execute arbitrary SQL. So if I wanted to see all the things from my feature group, uh, but I want to limit it to where, let's say, slag equals zero, for example, I can execute this arbitrary SQL. And what I'll get in return is a table that only has rows with slag equals zero. Now, let's say we're really bad at SQL and we don't really know how to write great SQL. That's totally fine. As Bindu mentioned before, we have a lot of tools that we're starting to develop that are AI-assisted data science. What we can actually do is we can provide an English language prompt here, which will generate SQL for us, and then we can execute that SQL. For example, I can say, show me all of the rows where slag is zero. I can generate some SQL. which we'll see just generates the same thing I typed earlier. Give me everything from the feature group where slag is zero. Uh, let's do something else so we can see a brand new SQL. Show me the average of uh, water. Generate the SQL. I'm just getting the average of water from that feature group. So this is one of the big advances that we are working on in order to provide more AI-assisted uh, data science tools. Uh, for example, when we need to generate SQL and we're not great at it, what we can do is we can provide some plain text English and then generate SQL that way. Okay, it looks like for me, my uh, concrete data split feature group has completed, uh, completed materialization. Again, we have the same thing here where we can see our data explore page uh, as well as our materialized data page. Uh, you can see we have our trained test split column added, uh, proving that our transformations have worked. Just a reminder, in order to materialize a feature group, all we have to do is call this data split feature group dot materialize, uh, and then we wait for it to complete. This is again, one of our wait functions. So it'll complete, and then we can see all of the features in that feature group. So one important thing to note is we don't only have Python functions that we support. As I mentioned earlier, we can also execute SQL queries, SQL queries against our data sets. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to programmatically, based on our uh, previous feature group, define SQL in order to split our training and our predicting data. So the first step I'm doing here is I am finding all of the features but train and test, doing a simple list comprehension. And then you can see here I'm using Python's F format strings uh, in order to generate a SQL statement. Uh, you can see here, all I'm doing is I'm joining all of our features, but train test. So we select all of those features from, from our data split feature group. Uh, and then I'm filtering it. So where train test only equals train. This will give us a concrete uh, training data feature group at the end. And so I'll go ahead and give this the tags training and SQL. Again, just to reiterate that process, what I'm doing is I'm... Uh, constructing a F format string, injecting some Python code into my string, uh, as well as some attributes of my base table. And then I'm filtering this, this, S, this table on test. So now I'll generate my test data. So I now have my uh, training data and my test data as Abacus uh, feature groups. Again, we can always see this reflected in the UI, simply refresh the page. Uh, and now we have, uh, if we select the training, we'll see all of our training data. And if we select predicting, we'll see all of our predicting data. Additionally, we can see that uh, the feature groups which we tagged with SQL and the feature groups that we tagged with Python. Okay, we've done a lot of data preparation. We've created a bunch of different feature groups, and now we're ready to go ahead and train a model. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leverage the Abacus API create model from function. This is going to be very similar to create Python, uh, creating a Python function from a function, 
where all I'm doing is I'm passing callables into this, uh, into this API method in order to generate a model based on those functions that we're passing in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass our earlier defined train function and our earlier defined predict many function. Additionally, I'm going to um, define our input tables and we're going to utilize our concrete training data feature group. Uh, important to note here was that we are using a feature group and passing that feature group into this model. Finally, we can modify the CPU and memory size. So if we have a really, really large model that we want to uh, bring into Abacus, uh, it's very, very possible to scale these uh, to scale these parameters in order to fit that model. So we can increase this memory pretty high, and then we can add a larger CPU as needed. Again, this is a very simple, very basic model. We'll stick to 14 and a medium CPU size. I'll go ahead and generate that model, and we'll see that I created a model object with all of the information which we defined earlier, where we have our training input table and the source code that that model object will be utilizing. I'll go ahead and utilize an, an, another one of our waiting functions and wait for this model to train. Since this is a very simple model, I do expect this to take about five to six minutes, uh, not much longer. Uh, again, another great time. Go ahead and post in the Q&A if you have any questions. Uh, the chat scrolls a little too fast for us to respond to. So if you do have great questions, uh, or if you do have questions, go ahead and uh, post in Q&A. Uh, here's a great one from Marcelo. What is the underlying SQL dialect? Our SQL dialect, here, let me see if I can answer live. Our SQL dialect is actually uh, Spark SQL. Uh, so you can utilize Spark SQL and um, uh, leverage that uh, dialect here in Navicus. Um, Pradeep is asking, how is this different from SageMaker? Uh, a lot of the difference between us and SageMaker is our ease of usability. We have a really strong UI that makes it very simple to do a lot of this. Um, additionally, uh, we have really uh, straightforward APIs that make it super easy, uh, as hopefully you're seeing here, to go from training a model locally to bringing that model into the Abacus system. Of course, this is all very pragmatic, uh, programmatic, where we can do pretty much anything in Abacus that is in the UI through an API as well. Uh, additionally, of course, a lot of the services and personalizations we offer to our client is very uh, is very different from SageMaker. We really pride in our ourselves and our customer first approach. Um, I was asked, why don't we use data frames instead of feature groups? I don't fully understand. Feature groups are basically data frames expressed in Abacus. Uh, so I'll go ahead and answer live. Uh, so the difference between data frames and feature groups is fairly negligible. Uh, basically, um, a feature group is, in a sense, a data frame. It's just the Abacus expression of that and allows us to pass those uh, data frames, uh, those, those data frames into Abacus models and utilize them for transformation. <clears throat> so I'm still waiting for my model to complete training. Uh, you can see here that I'm still in the training status. We started this about a minute ago. So again, this is going to take a little bit of time um, the materialization step after defining the feature group. Uh, basically, what, what materialization is doing, uh, when we have all of our feature groups, it's developing a tree of data transformations. So in order to keep that tree efficient, we don't fully materialize and bring in our data every time we create a new feature group. You can think of every feature group as a table view more so than as a um, as a table view more so than as a solid data frame. That table view becomes a solid data frame when we do materialize that feature group. So basically, we're making what was previously a view into a real live uh, table. Uh, Gloria is on seven. One second here. Let's see what seven is.
Just continuing to answer some Q and A's here. Uh, is it necessary to materialize a feature group before giving it to a model for training? No, our model training step will do that. At, uh, let me go ahead and answer live. Uh, no, you do not need to materialize a feature group before giving it a model for training. Uh, that's because our model training will automatically uh, materialize that feature group. Additionally, we utilize checksums in order to make sure there's actually something new in that feature group. Uh, if there is nothing new in that feature group, then we go ahead and skip that materialization step. Again, just to improve efficiency and keep things uh, at cost efficient. Uh, here's another great question from Marcelo. Uh, I, I did forget to review this. Thank you for reminding me. Why do we need to import pandas into our function definitions? Uh, I'll go ahead and answer that live. Uh, the reason why we need to import pandas into our function definitions is because when we utilize them as Python feature groups, they're actually running in their own isolated environment. So in that environment, we need to ensure that we've imported all of the packages uh, that we're utilizing uh, within that user code environment. Uh, the way that we ensure packages and dependencies don't conflict is we we maintain those ourselves uh, and as needed, uh, we can provide and uh, give give uh, different uh, package versions, etc. Generally, we utilize either the latest or the second to latest version of those packages. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. It looks like my model has completed training. Uh, I can verify that in the UI. I can see that this training has completed. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward in the notebook. Uh, so in order to deploy our model, now that we've gone ahead and generated that model, the next step to do is deploy it. Basically what deploying a model means is generating a model server. This will allow you to get predictions uh, from that model uh, and, and getting uh, either predictions in singleton or predictions in batch. We'll go over both of those. And more importantly, we'll demonstrate that we're getting parity between that local model that we built earlier, as well as with the Abacus AI hosted model. I'll go ahead and create this deployment and wait for it here. Uh, so again, this is a good waiting function. We'll wait to see when the deployment completes. And again, as always, we'll see this reflected in the UI. Uh, we're, we're currently deploying this model. Uh, we can wait for that status to go to complete. Uh, in addition, we are um, waiting for it here, leveraging the uh, API. Okay, uh, so we've gone ahead and deployed our model here. Um, the next steps here is I'm going to utilize that uh, previous local model to generate some more predictions. This is, this is just so we can see them. Uh, you can see I'm passing the local model to the predict many. Uh, next, uh, we can go ahead and perform the same predictions utilizing our client. So I'm going to use utilize client.predict pass in the deployment token, as well as the deployment that we just generated, and pass those records as a JSON. So these are our predictions in Singleton, utilizing our API client. We'll see, since we trained the same model on the same seed with the same exact data, we're receiving complete one-to-one -one parity between our predictions, uh, between the local and the, and the uh, Abacus AI hosted model.
Next, how can we generate these predictions in batch? Uh, generally, when we have um, a classification or regression or forecasting based problems, what we'll want to do is we'll want to create a bunch of predictions at once. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a batch prediction. I'm going to kick it off and wait for it to run. Uh, the way I did this batch prediction is I actually overrode our input table. So I said, OK, instead of utilizing whatever other input table we want, let's actually use our um, concrete predicting data feature group as the table to predict over. So you can see that I use this set feature group API. I passed our concrete prediction data uh, feature group. So now we'll predict uh, over all of the rows in that feature group. Uh, additionally, uh, we can see that we can output all of the metadata. These are things such as the batch prediction version, the time of the batch prediction, as well as the model version associated with that batch prediction. Finally, the most the, the, the last thing to note here is we are outputting to a feature group itself. So what we, what we can do is we can output our batch prediction data to three different locations. We can output it directly to our console. We can output it to a file connector that we have connected to the Abacus service, or we can output it directly back to Abacus uh, so we can manipulate and modify the data that way. Additionally, all feature groups are exportable to those file services. Uh, so you can, um, once you have outputted to a feature group, you can go ahead and uh, output that feature group to whatever file connector service you have uh, as well. Waiting for our predictions here. This does take around four to five minutes. Again, great time for Q&A. Let me go ahead and go through these. Uh, so Mike is asking about the second tab. I'm hoping that you are discussing here. Uh, this is again our project list. Uh, this should be uh, everything that we've created utilizing the API so far. Uh, and you can see all the different artifacts that you have successfully created. Uh, for example, I do have uh, one data set in and one data set being processed. That data set being processed is our batch prediction data set. And then you can see here I have feature groups and one new feature group being processed. Uh, that feature group being processed is our batch prediction output. The five feature groups I've generated is that base data, the two Python transformations, and the two SQL transformations. Finally, we can see I have one model in this project, as well as one deployment. Um, <clears throat> additionally, and we'll go over this in a little bit more detail, uh, we do have model monitors, which allow you to monitor your model's performance, as well as any drift between input and output features. If we click into the project, we can see that we have all of this information reflected in more detail across our three steps. Step one, which is data ingestion. Step two, which is data manipulation. Step three, which is models. And step four are those model servers. Uh, Marcelo, again, has asked, asked another great question. Is it possible to schedule the execution of batch predictions Yes, 100%. That is the automated pipelines that we've been talking about. You can schedule all of these jobs end to end uh, utilizing a cron scheduling. So if I go ahead and click here, uh, I can. this is an uploaded data set, so I don't have the ability to refresh this. For data sets that you are importing from a external service on a regular schedule, you can define a cron job to execute that regularly. You'll see that in our models, we do have this add new refresh schedule, as well as in our batch predictions where we can add a refresh schedule. This allows you, again, to execute those jobs uh, on, on a periodic basis, uh, allowing you to define when they run uh, and how often they run. One thing to note is that our monitors are automatically created whenever we do a batch prediction. So in a project, if you generate a batch prediction, we automatically generate a model monitor alongside it 
to view the drift data integrity as well as outliers that may exist from that batch prediction. This is our basic monitoring page where you can see um, some of this occurring. I'll dive into this a little bit more uh, in the next project that we generate. Jumping back to the notebook, we can see that our batch prediction completed. So now we can look at our output feature group. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna make sure it's materialized and then I'm going to load in one of the big powers of feature groups is that we can load these into our notebook as data frames. Uh, so you can see here, I'm looking at the latest version of this feature group. Um, and then I'm loading it as a Pandas data frame, which allows me to manipulate and view it within the notebook as well. If we look at the head, which is the first five rows, again, we'll see exact parity between our batch predictions, our, our prediction API, and then our local prediction as well. Basically, what we've just demonstrated is that we can train a model locally, and then we can leverage the Abacus API and infrastructure in order to bring that model into the Abacus system and execute it, uh, utilizing that infrastructure as well, all while generating the same exact results that we received earlier. Uh, before I answer any more questions, I do want to dive into this next segment and get this project started. Uh, again, in the next wait period, I will go ahead and start to answer some more questions. But this is where things are going to get really interesting. Uh, this is what we call BYOA. Uh, this is what will enable you to run your own algorithm alongside our, our in-house uh, world-class algorithms that we've generated as well. This allows you to benchmark your algorithm against other state-of-the-art algorithms to see how well you're performing. Additionally, if you find that your algorithm is the highest performer, obviously you can leverage that and then utilize that as, uh, as your prediction mechanism. So the first thing we're going to do, just as earlier, is we're going to create a new project. Uh, the use case is predicting. Uh, so basically what this is going to do is it's going to leverage our generalized use case predictive modeling. Uh, predictive modeling is our general use case for anything regression and classification based. Uh, we've put a lot of work into it and we we're really confident with its ability. So we're gonna leverage that use case uh, today. You'll see here, I just created a project ar uh, project artifact. Uh, use case is predicting, and then our problem type is regression. So what I'm going to add to this project is that data split table that we created earlier. Uh, I'll exemplify why we're doing that uh, in a moment here, but we do want just that data split table with the train test column predefined. So as you can see, I can add to project. Next, we have use case requirements. Now, again, since we are leveraging the Abacus base uh, and are going to be using Abacus uh, algorithms as well, there's a little bit more work that we have to do in setting up this project. Uh, you can see here each use case does have different requirements. And so for our BYOA projects use case, I'll go ahead and list out all of those requirements. So the two primary requirements are the data set types that we need or feature group types that we need. We need a custom table, and then we need certain feature mappings for that custom table. Feature mappings is how we tell all of our algorithms how to ingest the data. So for example, in predictive modeling, we need a target variable. Say, hey, this is what we're trying to predict. This is what you need to look at and learn about. Additionally, we can ignore features in this use case uh, and cause them to not be seen by the model. So now that we know what feature mappings we need, we can leverage our API set feature mapping uh, in order to set our CSMPA feature as our target. Again, we are trying to predict the, the structural strength of different concrete based on their attributes. So I'll go ahead and set this feature mapping, and we can see that reflected here where CSMPA is now our target. So let's go ahead and validate that our project is ready for model training. We can do that by calling the validate function and passing in the feature group IDs that we want to utilize in training. So now I see that my project is valid, valid equals true for my project validation. 
The next step is going to be seeing all of the different training configura configuration options that we can utilize. A big, big powerful thing with BYOA is being able to leverage any of the Abacus training options within your own algorithm as well. I'll exemplify how we account for that in our algorithm and how we do have to modify our algorithm code slightly in order to account for these additional training options. So within our uh, predictive modeling, we have all of these uh, options available where we can do k-fold cross-validation, we can define a test split uh, based on percentages, uh, and most importantly here, you can see we can provide a test row indicator. We're going to leverage this test row indicator uh, in order to ensure that our training and test data that we defined in our column train tests is respected by the model. In order to make sure that the uh, algorithm that we are passing into the Abacus system is correct and will work, we have developed some uh, APIs in order to uh, map the exact input that we would provide to the Abacus model uh, in our notebook as well. So I'm going to define some configurations. I'm going to utilize the Abacus AI configuration test row indicator, and I'm going to map that to our train test column. I'm going to define our training table name as the data split feature group dot table name. And I'm going to provide our user configuration as well, which will be n quantiles. If you remember earlier, we did utilize a quantile transformer uh, with a set uh, 20 quantiles. Now with this BYOA setup, we can set different uh, quantile uh, numbers. So within the Abacus platform, you can generate a bunch of different models uh, utilizing uh, different quantiles. Uh, this is really good, for example, if you want to do uh, different space searches. So if you want to search, uh, you know, if you want to see how your model performs differently with 10, 15, 20 quantiles, you can leverage the Abacus API in order to train uh, those three different models across those different quantiles. The next step is I'm just going to combine our, uh, our Abacus config and our user config by defining a new dictionary, um, which we'll see here. So you'll see we have our test row indicator, which is an abacus config, and then we have all the user configs nested into the sub dictionary, which is user with n quantiles mapping to 20. As I mentioned, we do need to manipulate the uh, train function to fit the abacus framework a little bit. You'll see that originally in our train function, we were only passing training data. Now in our train function, we can pass training data. We can pass schema mappings. That's that feature mapping that we set earlier. And we can also pass the training config. This really makes our model super generalizable and allows you to use this across all regression uh, problems that you would like to solve. So let's say that we wanted to use the same model to classify the quality of different wines based on attributes. We can leverage the same BYOA model, uh, which is really just a linear regression, and apply it to that uh, wine quality data set as well. So how do we uh, how do we account for this in our uh, in our function? So what we first do is we get our train test column. Uh, so if we have a test row indicator, we'll get a we'll, we'll get that train test column so that we can make sure it's not included in the model earlier and only utilized to split the data. We can get our user defined configuration, and that's just getting that user dictionary. And then of course we can get the end quantiles that we set from that user dictionary as well. We set a random seed, and then we pull from our schema mappings, the important columns. So we get the target column, and if no target column exists, we can raise a user feedback error saying, hey, you didn't give us a target column to predict against. Additionally, if there are any ignore columns, we can pull those out of our schema mapping as well. And then uh, both of those can be utilized in order, we, we can utilize both of those variables uh, in order to drop that from our training data. That way, anything we want to ignore will not be used in train. And of course, we do not want our target to be used in training as well. Otherwise, it's that same linear regression where we're passing the n quantiles variable to our quantile transformer, generating a linear regression, and then fitting that linear regression model. Our outputs are very similar, where we're outputting columns, we're outputting the target column itself, 
our quantile transformation tr transformer, and of course our model. So we can use the get train function input uh, abacus API in order to get our input for the training function. Uh, you can see that uh, we'll pretty much mimic how Abacus will pass these parameters into your algorithm itself and then train that model locally. One thing to note is I am passing only the train rows into this local model. We are getting the identical uh, R squared where it's still 0.911. Uh, again, demonstrating that this local model is the same as the previous local model, which we instantiated earlier. Of course, we need our predict many function as well. This is again, almost identical to prior where we're taking the columns, the target columns, the quantile transformer and our linear model, and then generating predictions and then outputting those predictions in a list of, in a, in a list of dictionaries. So with our local BYOA model, again, we're seeing that same parity where we're generating the same uh, exact prediction results over our prediction data. The next step will be registering that algorithm. So we defined the train function, we defined the predict function, we tested them in the notebook environment, ensured everything was working, and now we're going to uh, define our new algorithm. Uh, you can define your own algorithm name here. I have Brandon Workshop Algo. Uh, you can name that whatever you'd like. One caveat being is it does need to be all caps with no spaces, and you must prefix with this user dot user dot followed by your unique algorithm name. You'll also see we have this algorithm scope variable. Uh, you can either have a project or an organization scoped algorithm. If you plan on using this algorithm across many projects within your organization, you can set this to the organization scope uh, in order to use it across projects. If you just want the algorithm used in this single project, we can scope it to the project itself. Next, we're going to create that algorithm. So what this will do is it'll create a algorithm object that contains the, uh, again, the different mappings for inputs, as well as our train function and our predict function. I'll go ahead and execute that. And now finally, with a registered algorithm, we can go ahead and train a model. This is actually just use, utilizing the Abacus train model API which will allow you to pass which custom algorithms you wanna train with that model, as well as the configurations for that custom algorithm. I'm gonna go ahead and kick off this train job and then I'll do, uh, I'll spend some time discussing what we've just done uh, as we wait for that to complete. Uh, I would recommend executing this other cell as well. What I did here is I defined my own helper function, which will stop, uh, it won't stop training, but it'll allow us to move forward once our uh, specific algorithm has completed training. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and navigate to the UI and kind of talk about everything that just happened. We did do a lot in a really small amount of time. Uh, so if I go ahead and hit the, uh, if, I, if I look at my project list, uh, I refresh it and I can see that I have my Brandon BYOA workshop project. I'm gonna click into that. And you'll see that we have step one, step two, step three, and step four, just as we saw in the other uh, classical project. The biggest difference to note here is if we hit custom table, and then we go to the features page, we'll see that our target mapping has been mapped to CSMPA. So feature mappings, we now have a target on CSMPA. The other big difference here is if we go to models, uh, you can see we're utilizing our test row indicator. Uh, and then additionally, we have our uh, parameters being passed uh, into this model. We're currently doing some training. So instead of only training our single uh, algorithm that we define, we're actually going to be training the entire suite of Abacus AI models that we generate. We'll be able to see that once the first model has completed. Uh, we'll be able to go to the metrics page and then see all of the different models that we're training. So in Abacus, when we train a single model, we're actually training a group of models. That group of models each has their own algorithm structure, each perform their own uh, hyperparameter optimization, as well as their own neural architectural search.
Uh, so uh, we were asked, how does how does Abacus AI receive new data after users consume the endpoints? Uh, so basically what we'll do is we'll utilize those uh, refresh schedules uh, in order to pull in new data, as well as utilize those refresh schedules to output uh, new predictions. Uh, basically, our end-to-end -end revolves around refresh schedules. How do we manage artifacts and version control? You can see that we have uh, versions for all of our um, artifacts. And then additionally, in feature groups specifically, uh, across versions, we can see uh, different uh, any changes that have occurred from one version to the other. Uh, otherwise, we just utilize basic version control here uh, in order to know uh, what's being generated and how things are changing. Uh, I was asked, can we model the model, the model for specific drift values and retrain the model in a scheduled way? Uh, yes. Uh, again, that's that refresh schedule that I mentioned earlier. You can see that on the screen here, refresh schedules. Adding a new fruit refresh schedule allows you to retrain the model in a scheduled way. And then as I mentioned earlier, our model monitors allow you to uh, look for drift across different features and see that how different features are changing over time. Again, for anybody looking for that notebook, uh, we do have it in the answered Q&A section. There are a couple of different links that you can follow, uh, specifically the notebook being available on Google Drive. And then if anybody is really just brand new, uh, you can also utilize our signup token. Okay, so again, we're going to continue to wait for this model to train. It will take a little bit longer as we are running all of the Abacus models and implementing a lot of the um, Abacus side uh, things as well. Okay, great. So our algorithm has finished training, and we can see that in our deployable algorithms list. You'll see, for example, if I have user brand and workshop algo, uh, and so that means that my algorithm is ready to, to deploy. You also see a bunch of different other algorithms. Again, that is emphasizing how we are creating more than one model in our model group. You'll see some models are still training, uh, but we do have a, a best fit neural network, a cat boost model, an XG boost model, a linear model, an attention deep learning model, and then finally my own algorithm. Uh, you can see my, my algorithm itself has a pretty high error rate at 5.83, whereas the abacus models have much lower errors, 2.5, 2.78, for example. Um, okay, so uh, from here, uh, that's just an exemplification of our metric screen. We can see different metrics across models. Uh, we can get artifacts from each model as well as the, the logs associated with them. So if there's any logs uh, associated with your model or any artifacts such as for the XG boost, uh, you can download a zip file that will include the uh, architect structure. Uh, basically just our metrics UI. We'll hop back to our notebook, and what we're going to do is we're going to set the default algorithm to our own algorithm. This way we can test the predictions of our algorithm and see what we're outputting. By setting a default algorithm, it means that whenever we create a deployment, that deployment will automatically uh, set to that algorithm. We do have the option to create deployments across all algorithms if we would like, uh, and you can deploy 
uh, every algorithm that we generate. I'll go ahead and exemplify that in the UI. It's a little easier to see it that way. So for example, if I create a new deployment, you'll see we have two options, offline batch and offline real time. Uh, so real time will allow us to make those predictions in singleton, where offline batch will allow us to do batch. Batch plus real time is obviously the capability to do, to do both of those. If you do not need real time predictions, it's often recommended to use a offline batch deployment. Once I select next, you can see I can select the model version I want to deploy. And then additionally, I can select the algorithm I want to deploy. So if I want to deploy the XG boost algorithm, I can go ahead and make this the XG boost deployment and then deploy that model. Uh, additionally, on your deployment page, you'll see the BYOA deployment going out as well. We'll go ahead and wait for these deployments to complete, generate some predictions, as well as a batch prediction. Okay, our BYOA deployment is done. So again, just to exemplify parity, that our local model is making the same as our uh, abacus model, which is making the same as our batch predictions. I'll go ahead and run that local model. I'll run our abacus model. Predictions are identical. And then I'll do a very similar process for creating our batch prediction that we did earlier. But instead of providing a feature group override, I'm just going to provide a predict for eval. What this will do is it'll predict over all of our uh, test data that we defined earlier. If you remember, we used a train test split, which had column values of either train or test. Uh, all of those test points will now be utilized in this predict for evaluation to determine how well our model is doing or to see the predictions we're making over that test set. Again, I'm including my metadata so I can see my versions and I'm outputting to a feature group uh, so I can manipulate and modify the data as needed. Again, we can see that reflected in our batch prediction page. Uh, we can see I'm making a new batch prediction where my feature group is going to be the BYOA evaluation output. Uh, I'm outputting to a feature group. I'm including my metadata and I'm predicting for evaluation. While we wait for that, I'm going to hop back to the um, Q&A and see if there's any great uh, questions here. Uh, Venkatesh asked if we can uh, modify existing uh, abacus models. No, you cannot. You can only modify your own algorithms that you are bringing. Uh, the abacus models, again, are, that's our own models that we're creating and generating. Um, yeah, you, you, we, we don't allow you to modify those yourself. You can modify your own algorithm as much as you would like. So our batch prediction has completed and we are just waiting for that output feature group to materialize so we can view the data within it. Okay, our feature group has finished materializing. Uh, so back in the notebook, uh, we can see here our head of that feature group. Again, we loaded the latest version uh, as a Pandas data frame. We're looking at prediction CSMPA in the first five rows. Again, finally demonstrating complete parity between, um, first of all, our prediction API and our local model predictions, as well as if you scroll all the way back to the top, you'll see that we are still getting the same exact numbers that we originally got when we first defined our local training and prediction functions here. That basically concludes, and I'll just show this here. So we see 37.697798, that's reflected identically here. And we can see that across all of the points. 
in conclusion, what we've done today is we trained a model locally. We took our own model code and say, hey, I have a notebook environment. I want to execute this model code. I then predicted against that model. And then I found the results from that prediction, from those predictions. The next thing I did is I created an Abacus AI project, which allowed me to bring in my custom Python model and execute it independently on the Abacus infrastructure. What this will allow me to do is to monitor this model, uh, upload, update it with uh, re automatic refresh policies, as well as generate new predictions with refresh policies as well. So basically what I can do with my model is I can run it end to end in an automated fashion and monitor it utilizing the Abacus platform. We took it as one step further and we said, hey, I think my model's awesome, but maybe Abacus has some great offerings as well. Let me compare how my model is performing to that of Abacus. So what we did is we utilized a normal Abacus project called predictive modeling. We pulled in our data set and then we trained our model utilizing a modified user code in order to create the same experience uh, as you would as running a Abacus model uh, itself. Basically what we have is we have all of the Abacus models as well as our own algorithm to compare against. Now that our uh, batch prediction has completed, I do wanna go a little bit over our uh, monitoring offerings. So as I mentioned before, uh, every batch prediction also creates a model monitor. And in that monitor, we'll see things such as drift analysis across different uh, features. We'll basically see uh, how our feature is drifting. Uh, we can see any our, how our data integrity is. So for example, if we had null violations or type mismatches or categorical range, viola range violations between our training and predicting data, they would appear here. Uh, finally, we can also do any outlier detection. So if there's any outliers within between our uh, predicting and training data, those will appear here again across all features. Uh, additionally, this is some drift analysis, just showing you the exact rows that are drifting uh, from here. So for example, with course aggregate, we see a KS drift of 0 0.05. We can go ahead and view those rows that are the specific rows which are drifting. Rows that contribute most to JS drift and rows that contribute most to KL drift. Additionally, we can have a summary. So when we have model versions over time, we'll see the different violations as they appear over time for those, um, for those monitors. You can see we only have one version here, which is our first base point with no violations. Uh, to see the monitor created, we use this uh, here. Glenn asked where we can see the, mon the monitor is created. Uh, you can see that here in the model monitors tab on the left nav of the UI. It's easiest to view this. Uh, I mean, we, we do have the API hooks to view all of these. It's definitely easiest to see it through the UI as it's a very graphic based um, uh, feature. Okay, I think that is, um, I think that's about everything that we have to show today. Um, I'll go ahead and leave the floor open for any final questions in the last 15 minutes here. Um, otherwise, thank you all for coming. Uh, really enjoyed presenting to you all, and I hope you really got something out of learning how to take those local models and bringing it to the Abacus system so you can leverage a lot of the built out features that we've implemented for an end to end machine learning operations uh, platform.
Great. Yeah, I think that's, uh, oh, here's some more Q&A. Yeah, I'll, I'll stick around for a little bit for Q&A. Uh, go ahead and, um, you know, post those there. Uh, of course, if you need anything else, you can reach out to us. Uh, I believe our LinkedIn is available. And then, of course, uh, any specific questions, you can reach out to me on, on LinkedIn as well. Uh, yes, everybody will be receiving a certificate at the end of this. Thank you, Tesh, asked about our different deployment options. Uh, so currently, we do uh, primarily focus on the um, uh, for, for deploying models, we primarily focus on our software as a service platform, which I generated today. For certain clients, we are able to do on-prem as well as hosting in your private cloud. Um, generally, though, we do recommend the software as a service. We are SOC 2 compliant as well as um, other different compliances. Uh, we have a really strong security and engineering team in that regard. Uh, so, um, yeah. We do offer other deployment types, but software as a service is generally how we go. Amir asked a great question. Uh, so uh, alerts can be determined, I'll uh, answer that live. Alerts can be determined for drift, uh, yes. So if your model does begin to drift in a way you didn't expect, uh, what you can do is you can um, set up emails to get uh, to receive an email whenever your model begins to drift. It'll actually alert you via email, yes. Uh, are the Abacus model? Uh, so the questions from Bax, are the Abacus models you compared against normal ML models or CNN based? Uh, do they leverage transfer learning? Uh, all of our models, uh, you'll see that they do have a specific algorithm definition uh, that we don't restrain ourselves to a single strategy. We try to leverage as many different strategies as we, as we can. I'm personally not specifically familiar with transfer learning. Um, of course, uh, we are trying to stay state of the art. So as we find new state of the art algorithms that need implemented in our solution, we will do so. Ken asked for a canonical list of Abacus algos. Uh, generally, whenever you train a model utilizing our sample data sets, that would be a great way to see all of our algorithms. Uh, and then we do try to provide as much in-product help and information about those algorithms that we can. Um, we did have some questions around pricing. Generally, our pricing is based around training, computation, predictions generated, and uh, as well as data transformations. Uh, I don't know the specific details around the pricing. Uh, you can definitely reach out to us, and uh, one of our sales reps will uh, assist you with more in-depth information about that. Uh, Mike. Mike asked if we have Mike asked if we had pre-trained models. Uh, yes, we do have pre-trained models, but those are specific to NER. So anything where we're trying to do um, uh, natural language processing, uh, NLP, such as uh, you know NER, which is named entity recognition, we leverage those pre-trained models primarily in either image processing or natural language processing. Uh, Nazneen. Uh, Nazneen asked if we can define thresholds for the data drift. Uh, yes, when you generate alerts, you can define different thresholds for those alerts to appear on. Uh, so if you get a, uh, if, if you want to be alerted when your feature drifts by X amount, you can define an, an alert that will send you an email that, hey, this feature drifted by this amount for this type of drift. So uh, Mike asked again some more details around our monitors, asking if uh, we can do monitoring across different training models. Yes, uh, again, all of our in-project monitors. So there's 
there's really two levels of monitors that we have. We have our in-project monitors, which will um, our in-project monitors, which will be generated based on your batch predictions. Whereas we also have the ability to create monitors outside of projects, which will just be comparing uh, training data with prediction data. Additionally, um, we can create monitors for uh, feature groups themselves, where you compare different versions of a feature group to see if your features within that group are drifting. Uh, for the prediction metrics on our model monitors, what we can do is we can provide a prediction metric input. Um, this will uh, allow you to perform decile and equal bin analysis for your classification problems. Uh, this applies less to the regression type of problem that we did. Again, with those model monitors outside of projects, we can find the accuracy and confusion matrix for models. Again, that's mostly for uh, classification over regression. Here's a fun question. We were asked if uh, Abacus is useful for social media post analysis. Yes, definitely. We have both great recommendation systems as well as natural language processing systems, which you can use to uh, measure the uh, valence of different social media posts, as well as understand the types of um, uh, emotions that people are feeling about those media posts. So uh, for how does Abacus ingest new data? Again, we utilize those refresh schedules to connect with a database connector. Uh, I can show this briefly. So within Abacus, we have the ability to connect to a bunch of different data lakes. Uh, anything from uh, you know, BigQuery, Snowflake, ODBC, JDBC, uh, Google Cloud Storage, et cetera. When we're connected to those data lakes, we can set up refresh pipelines that will uh, uh, repeatedly read and ingest new data. So if you have all of your Salesforce data stored on Salesforce and you want to predict how your leads are doing and do some lead scoring, you can easily do so by connecting your Salesforce connector and then setting that up on a refresh schedule to cons cons consistently get new data. Uh, scalability works by utilizing Kubernetes. Basically, we have a really strong, again, infrastructure team that has, a, has, has the ability to scale very, very well. Um, we, we have models currently in production that are, you know, trillions of data rows, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, we're very capable of scaling and we, we don't, uh, you know, we believe that that's one of our strongest suits. Uh, yes, models are automatically versioned and registered. Whenever you train a new version, uh, you'll automatically get a new model version. You can also train multiple project models in a single project. Um, it's you can organize that however you would like. And whether you what is generally advised is if you are changing model options, it's best to train different models compared to changing the options on a single model and retraining. So coming back to the uh, model monitors a little bit, just kind of going into a little bit more detail. Uh, basically what these are for is for, uh, it's primarily for feature drift analysis. So if your feature ends up changing over time, that can cause your model's predictions to change as well. So what we wanna do is we wanna be able to identify and debug that model if our predictions change drastically. So what we can do with this monitoring is every time a new prediction is made, uh, we can go ahead and compare how the training and the prediction data look. For example, you may not always retrain your model, but you may have new prediction data that you want to uh, analyze. So when you pass in that new prediction data to your batch prediction, you'll wanna see how that prediction data may be different from your training data. If there is a very large difference, it may be time to retrain that model to help it learn uh, about some of these new trends that are being introduced to your data. Uh, here's, 
here's another really good question about adding Abacus uh, into your own website to help make recommendations. That is 100% what our API is for. Uh, of course, we have a real-time API as well uh, that will help you with getting those recommendations out to your users quickly and rapidly. So yes. Uh, we do not currently have a reactive retrain. Uh, and if there is drift, we do not automatically retrain. It's a little too invasive. It's a little too intrusive on your process. Uh, so we highly encourage that to be a more manual uh, debugging and ensuring that you actually want to retrain. Uh, so no, we do not currently automate training based on drift. The free trial credits do not have an expiry date. Uh, it's basically just um, as you use those credits. Uh, just emphasizing again, batch alerts. Uh, so when we have a model monitor, we can add a new alert, uh, which allows us to email us if, um, if a certain feature is drifting by a certain amount, if our accuracy drops below a threshold, if we end up having data integrity violations, uh, et cetera. Here's another good question is if it's possible to integrate Abacus with other data science tools. Um, we, we don't, uh, obviously, again, with our API, you can integrate it into whatever you would like. Um, we do fully strongly believe that we are an end to end data science tool. We don't believe that you should ever have to leave the Abacus platform. And we think that everything that you would possibly want to do as a data scientist is available here in Abacus AI. So you can integrate it with other data science tools. But we don't feel that that's very necessary. And if there are things that aren't in the platform, again, we're very customer focused and customer based. So we're always improving and adding new tools to help data scientists uh, achieve the goals they would like to. Okay, I think that's all the questions. So I will now just briefly cover a few more things. I will be uploading the recording of this workshop immediately right after this ends, and you can expect that within two to three hours or by the end of the day. I will now post the channel on chat. This is where it will be uploaded. If you missed that link, it's just advocates.ai in YouTube. As for the certificate, I will distribute those either by tomorrow or sometime by the end of the week. Um, it will come to those who actually did the um demo and participated in the workshop so don't worry about that um everyone else thank you for showing up thank you to brandon for the wonderful presentation and have a good rest of your day bye bye everyone thank you